unbelievable that in the most famous city of the richest country in the world, they're digging mass graves. You have death rates now, they are going to go up. Those numbers are going to go up. The closer people get to one another, the more deaths we're going to see. It was saying it would be 60 something, it's already past that. Uh, the president now says 80,000 or 90,000, maybe 100,000. More Americans are going to soon be dead. Death projections. Death projections. Death projections. Death projections. You're back. I'm back. We're both dying. <laughs> Here's a second philosophy of death a la plastic pills. The last vid covered Heidegger's being towards death. Real proper philosophy, right? And while I wish that phenomenology still had the gravitas it probably deserves, lately I feel like these post-structuralist applications feel more relevant, applicable, even true. In advanced programs, academics don't tend to read Baudrillard all that much. He's not taken all that seriously, mainly because he writes polemically instead of using arguments most of the time. In the online social world, though, polemics also get you further than arguments do. And even more than the form of debate, and maybe this is just my own sensibility, but it feels like the phenomenal world has fallen into screens. And there's a sense of loss in that fallenness a loss of the thickness and friction that you might expect the world to have. <laughs> That's probably the reason this is my fifth video on Baudrillard. Baudrillard writes in Symbolic Exchange and Death that a revolution has put an end to this classical economics of value, a revolution of value itself, which carries value beyond its commodity form into its radical form, beyond all reference to a real. So here, commodities are exchanged to be sure, but their use value and exchange value from classical economics, you know, basic supply and demand, are replaced because everything is overproduced, such that now the value that is exchanged is symbolic and it overcodes both use and exchange value. Symbolic exchange does not only apply to commodities, though. It also applies to the facts of reality, including the most factical of facts death, that we are going to die. On our screens, death is abstracted and modeled into graphs and accompanied by prescriptions of how you should live to avoid it. The way these are presented, the only purpose of life is avoiding death. X hours of exercise per week, prescribed diets, and warnings against anything which may cause your life to be shortened. Death for us is the opposite of health, it's sickness. And this is unique in human history. No culture before ours has ever been so averse to death, our one guarantee. Here's what other cultures have done with that. The difference between them and us is that for them, death signifies something. For us, it's a negation. It only has a negative value, the absence of health. Don't mistake this for romanticizing la pensée sauvage, the savage mind here. They surely prohibit other signs from having meaning, but the notable feature of us is that we prohibit death from having symbolic value. At the very core of the rationality of our culture is an exclusion that precedes every other, preceding all these and serving as their model the exclusion of the dead and of death. It's a sort of theme of post-structuralism that societies, or sign systems in this case, are in large part defined by what they repress and banish. For Foucault, for example, mad societies banish the mad to asylums. For Baudrillard, Dying societies banish living. The exchange is for mere survival, survival at all costs, even if it means uploading your brain into the cloud. Part of valuing death, conversely, is knowing how to live. In other science societies, death is not opposed to human being. Death may even give an individual more power, a boost in social status. Reverence in death from which you can guide the living, you know, ancestor worship. For us, death has no meaning. 
the dead are thrown out of the group's symbolic circulation. They are no longer beings with a role to play. So we have a rather unusual attitude towards death relative to the breadth of social systems that have existed. Those that are more symbolic with respect to death also tend to be more collectivist, such that even the dead are included in everyday life. According to Baudrillard, death is ultimately nothing more than the social line of demarcation, separating the dead from the living. There is a medical definition of death, one we're familiar with, but there are many others as well. Death can be a graduation. Death can be merely a part of a reversible cycle. Modern bureaucratic routinization strips meaning out of death to turn it into metrics, measurements of efficacy, leadership, or a biopolitical testing mechanism. It is now composed of graphics for the benefit of a consumer society. Of course, it sounds really reductive to blame capitalism for everything, but this pandemic is, I think, exposing the subliminal signification of death that's difficult to notice. In Plague, we are in the midst of death. And while that's always true, we are every day inundated with sensationalized, routinized models, mortality rates, death curves, statistics. These models draw a morbid fascination, otherwise they wouldn't keep showing them. As if seeing it there gives it a visible form and somehow gives us power over it. Right, so that's death. Now let's take a look at the dead and the role they play in a social system. Now our social relations are largely determined by our relation to capital and labor. Our exclusion of the dead, just like our exclusion of the mad and the elderly to asylums and nursing homes, is based on the fact that they can no longer work or produce capital. In virtually all pre-capitalist societies, the elderly, the mad, and the dead were consulted for their wisdom. Yes, even the mad. Madness was often associated with a connection to the gods or the spirit world. I rushed over the notion of exclusion or prohibition, and this happens in a sign system. Now, we're familiar with the term discrimination, and there's, you know, unacceptable forms of discrimination, uh, sexism, racism, and there's also generally accepted forms. For example, children are not allowed to vote. Criminals are incarcerated and others are institutionalized. And these are more or less generally accepted discriminations. And in each case, something happens called ghettoization. Ghettoization is where you separate a group of people off from society. It's literal discrimination. Now it's been the norm in human cultures that the dead have a say. One dead Pharaoh and his wives have more value than the whole living population. Other examples, Odysseus gets instructions from his dead friends and a prophet on how he's supposed to get home in his titular journey. In the Hebrew Bible, which forbids necromancy, King Saul consults a dead prophet through a witch. Christians ask dead saints to intercede for them. And the cover of this book shows the Mexican Day of the Dead, where you set up shrines, eat with, and remember dead ancestors. Outside of these enclaves, though, the dead are disenchanted such that they're not people, for the most part. And that's unique historically because the dead and our response to them is not an isolated event. It's always social. It represents a change in social status with a before and an after. The dead are often sought for their wisdom and experience from, from past relatives to saints. For Baudrillard, we are an exception because we discriminate against the dead. And this ghettoization of the dead happens literally too. This is a modern situation. You can look at the layout of planned cities. Graveyards are now pushed to the fringes, whereas back in the day, the graveyard was on the church grounds, always in the center of town. Paris, for example, is an interesting case where many of the city cemeteries were emptied in the late 18th century and moved literally underground. Plagues often bring new meaning to death, but ours is nothing like that sacred meaning. These deaths are merely an indicator of bureaucratic performance. It's a metric. Can you think of anything more banal? News hosts throw up these graphs and charts and simply use it as a measure of, you know, government response. Death is a metric by which we judge the living. Jim, a, a grim new death toll and frightening new projections, but the president and his team, at least some members of his team, don't necessarily believe all the numbers. Uh, that's right, Well, A tug of war has begun inside the Trump administration over whether the U.S. is overcounting the number of dead from the coronavirus. South Korea, good job, guys. America, bad president. 
Think of what an alien viewpoint that represents in terms of death. Like Baudrillard said, all of these piles of dead people are playing a social role as part of this political narrative. It's slightly obscene. There is nothing left of the sacred, of course, no concept of death as a journey, and no concept of death as a change in social status in a collective. Here's my theory on this. This is because we only view ourselves as individuals and don't really tend to imagine what death could mean in a collectivist sense. You know, like using death as a tool to advance a cause or a political project. That's not really part of our imaginary. Audriard does see the positive valuation of death in another group though, terrorists. This is not to condone terrorism, of course, yet they are an example of that positive value of death that we no longer have. For them, death and suicide is a symbolic weapon. The suicide bombing as an act has a symbolic value that cannot be uh, incorporated into the sign system of capitalism and empire. Suicide is an unsignifiable event. It doesn't have any economic value, but they have immense symbolic value. Al-Qaeda won the wars of the 21st century, which have been crushing symbolic defeats of the empire, dragging it into decades of war, a world away, indebting it and eroding faith in elected officials and very publicly destroying the vestiges of the moral superiority, imagined or otherwise, of the empire. Al-Qaeda understood symbolic exchange through the surplus value of suicide, more symbolic value than the exchange can handle. Because we do not understand death and because we can't signify it, Baudrillard views the goal of the modern project as the annihilation of death itself. Our imaginary is rife with these sorts of images of us eliminating and overcoming death. Those of cloning, uploading consciousness, and biotechnology to end aging. This should be terrifying. He speculates, clones of the future may well pay for the luxury of dying and becoming mortal once again in simulation, cyber death. Where previous generations suffered alienation, future generations face an infinitely worst prospect, the horror of never knowing death. This is like some Elon Musk fever dream, billionaires ending death. With it though, we've lost life. And that's why I made that previous video on being towards death. What are we left with? Without death, our projects, personal or social, have lost all urgency. The world wanes and pales. Now don't think of this as something that will happen when we cure death. It's something that has already happened since death has been disenchanted and yet goes unsignified. Over 130 years ago, Nietzsche speculated as to the end state of the modern project, calling us the last man. What is love? What is creation? What is longing? What is a star? So asks the last man and blinks. The earth has become small, and on it hops the last man, who makes everything small. His species is as ineradicable as the flea. The last man lives longest. Formerly, all the world was insane, say the subtlest of them, and they blink. We have discovered happiness, say the last man, and they blink.